Chapter 4, The Great Gatsby On Sunday morning, while church bells rang in the villages along shore, the world and its mistress returned to Gatsby's house and twinkled hilariously on his lawn. He's a bootlegger, said the young ladies, moving somewhere between his cocktails and his flowers. One time he killed a man who had found out that he was nephew to von Hindenburg and second cousin to the devil. Reach me a rose, honey and pour me a last drop into there, that there crystal glass. Once I wrote down on the empty spaces of a timetable the names of those who came to Gatsby's house that summer. It is an old timetable now, disintegrating at its folds and headed, this schedule in effect July 5th, 1922. But I can still read the gray names, and they will give you a better impression than my generalities of those who accepted Gatsby's hospitality and paid him the subtle tribute of knowing nothing whatever about him. From East Egg then came the Chester Beckers and the Leeches and a man named Munson, whom I knew at Yale, and Dr. Webster Kivett, who was drowned last summer up in Maine, and the Hornbeams and the Willie Voltaires and a whole clan named Black Buck, who always gathered in a corner and flipped up their noses like goats at whosoever came near, and the Ismays and the Christies, or rather Hubert Allback, and Mr. Christie's wife, and Edgar Beaver, whose hair, they say, turned cotton white one winter afternoon for no good reason. Um, where'd I go? Um... at all. Clarence Endive was from East Egg, as I remember. He came only once in white knickerbockers and had a fight with a bum named Eddie in the garden. From farther out on the island came the Cheetles and the ORP Schraders and the Stonewall Jackson Abrams of Georgia and the Fish Guards and the Ripley Snells. Snell was there three days before he went to... the penitentiary, so drunk out on the gravel drive that Mrs. Ulysses Sweat's automobile ran over his right hand. The Dancies came to an S.B. Whitebait, who was well over 60, and Maurice A. Flink and the Hammerheads and Beluga the Tobacco Importer and Beluga's Girls. From West Egg came the Poles and the Mulreedies and Cecil Roebuck and Cecil Schoen and Gulick the State Senator and Newton Orchid, who controlled films par excellence, and Exo Exhaust, and Clyde Cohen, and Don S. Schwartz, the son, and Arthur McCarty, all connected with the movies in one way or another, and the Catlips, and the Bembergs, and G. Earl Muldoon, brother to that Muldoon who afterwards strangled his wife, De Fontano, the promoter, came there, and Ed Legros, and James B. Rotgut, Ferret and D. Jongs and Ernest Lilly, they came to gamble, and when Ferret wandered into the garden, it meant he was cleaned out, and associated traction would have to fluctuate profitably next day. A man named Clip Springer was there so often and so long that he became known as the Border. I doubt if he had another home. Of theatrical people, there were Gus Ways and Horace O'Donovan and Lester Meyer and George Duckweed and Francis Bull. Also from New York were the Chromes and the Back Heisens and the Denikers and Russell Beatty and the Corrigans and the Kellehers and the Dewers and the Scullies and S.W. Belcher and the Smirks and the Young Quins, divorced now, and Henry L. Palmetto, who killed himself by jumping in front of a subway train in Times Square. Benny McClenahan arrived always with four girls. They were never quite the same ones in physical person, but they were so identical one with another that it inevitably seemed they had been there before. I had forgotten their names. Jacqueline, I think, or else Consuela, or Gloria, or Judy, or June, and their last names were either the melodious names of flowers and months or the sterner ones of the great American capitalists whose 
cousins, if pressed, they would confess themselves to be. In addition to all these, I can remember that Faustina O'Brien came there at least once, and the Baedeker girls and young Brewer who had his nose shut off in the war, and Mr. Al Bruxberger and Miss Haig, his fiancée, and Ardita Fitzpeters and Mr. P. Jewett, once head of the American Legion, and Miss Claudia Hip, with a man reputed to be her chauffeur and a prince of something, whom we call Duke, and whose name, if ever, if I ever knew it, I have forgotten. All these people came to Gatsby's house in the summer. At nine o'clock one morning late in July, Gatsby's gorgeous car lurched up the rocky drive to my door and gave out a burst of melody from its three-noted horn. It was the first time he had called on me. Though I had gone to two of his parties, mounted in his hydroplane, and at his urgent invitation made frequent use of his beach. Good morning, old sport. You're having lunch with me today, and I thought we'd ride up together. He was balancing himself on the dashboard of his car with that resourcefulness of movement that is so peculiar, peculiarly American that comes, I suppose, with the absence of lifting work or rigid sitting in youth and even more with the formless grace of our nervous sporadic games this quality was continually breaking through his punctilious manner in the shape of restlessness he was never quite still there was always a tapping foot somewhere or the impatient opening and closing of a hand he saw me looking with admiration at his car it's pretty, isn't it, old sport? He jumped off to give me a better view. Haven't you ever seen it before? I'd seen it. Everybody had seen it. It was a rich cream color, bright with nickels, swollen here and there in its monstrous length with triumphant hat boxes and supper boxes and tool boxes and terraced with a labyrinth of windshields that mirrored a dozen suns sitting down behind many layers of glass in a sort of green leather conservatory we started to town i had talked with him perhaps half a dozen times in the past month and found to my disappointment that he had little to say so my first impression that he was a person of some undefined consequence had gradually faded and he had become simply the proprietor of an elaborate roadhouse next door and then came that disconcerting ride. We hadn't reached West Egg Village before Gatsby began leaving his elegant sentences unfinished and slapping himself indecisively on the knee of his caramel-colored suit. Look here, old sport, he broke out surprisingly. What's your opinion of me anyhow? A little overwhelmed, I began generalized evasions, which that question deserves. Well... I'm going to tell you something about my life, he interrupted. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of me from all these stories you hear. So he was aware of the bizarre accusations that flavored conversation in his halls. I'll tell you God's truth, his right hand suddenly ordered divine retribution to stand by. I am the son of some wealthy people in the Middle West all dead now. I was brought up in America but educated at Oxford because all my ancestors have been educated there for many years. It is a family tradition. He looked at me sideways and I knew why Jordan Baker had believed he was lying. He hurried the phrase educated at Oxford or swallowed it or choked on it as though it had bothered him before and with this doubt his whole statement fell to pieces and I wondered if there wasn't something a little sinister about him. After all, what part of the Middle West, I inquired casually. San Francisco, I see. My family all died, and I came into a good deal of money. His voice was solemn, as if the memory of that sudden extinction of a clan still haunted him. For a moment, I suspected that he was pulling my leg, but a glance at him convinced me otherwise. After that... I lived like a young Raja in all the capitals of Europe, 
Paris, Venice, Rome, collecting jewels, chiefly rubies, hunting big game, painting a little things for myself only, and trying to forget something very sad that had happened to me long ago. With an effort, I managed to restrain my incredulous laughter. The very phrases were worn so threadbare that they evoked no image except that of a turbaned character leaking sawdust at every pore as he pursued a tiger through the Beau de Boulogne. Then came the war, old sport. It was a great relief, and I tried very hard to die, but I seemed to bear an enchanted life. I accepted a commission as first lieutenant when it began in the Argonne Forest. I, t I took two machine gun detachments so far forward that there was a half a mile gap on either side of us where the infantry couldn't advance. We stayed there two days and two nights. A hundred and thirty men were s with sixteen Lewis guns, and when the infantry came up at last, they found the insignia of three German divisions among the piles of dead. I was promoted to be a major, and every Allied government gave me a decoration. Even Montenegro, little Mon Montenegro down on the Adriatic Sea, 